last weekend for Valentine's Day, my wife and I, Mary Kendall, we went to Boone and we rented a yurt to stay the night. And it was it was in the boonies. <clears throat> so you turn off the road and you go a, a mile and a half down a very destroyed road almost and then it turns to gravel and when I say gravel I mean dirt um, it was one lane there was no guardrail and on the right side was a cliff drop off and so when I say it was in the boonies it was in the boonies but if you don't know what a yurt is imagine a tiny house with a kitchen a bed it's like a tiny hotel room it's one room but it's a tent it was in the middle of the woods. It was secluded. But at the top of our yurt was a domed window. Um, so while you laid in bed, you could look out at the sky. Um, and during the day, it was beautiful. But during the night, I'm not going to lie, it was kind of terrifying. The wind would blow. It was super windy. It was shaking the fabric of the tent. And as I looked out at the night sky through this roof, there was a huge tree that was rocking back and forth in our direction throughout the night. And you could just see the outline of the tree through the moonlight. And so we're laying there in this yurt, and the only thing that I'm thinking is, if this tree fell, it would crush us, and we would die. And I know that sounds morbid, but sometimes I'm pessimistic. But the tree was strong, and it was healthy. But the wind was also so strong that this sturdy, healthy tree was shaking back and forth. <clears throat> Matthew 7.25 says, And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And so in our faith, it's the exact same. If we don't set our faith on the roots of God, then when the winds come and the winds shake us, our faith will not be strong enough to hold and we will break off from the tree. And we might crush a yurt. But Ephesians 4.14 also says, So that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness, and deceitful schemes. And we go back to the Matthew 7 passage. In that story, it's a story about a house. But compared to the tree, it's the same. When life sends rain and storms and winds... Will our faith crumble beneath the pressure of the wind? Will our faith be steadfast? A lot of the Israelites' faith was not steadfast in the Old Testament and the New Testament. All throughout Scripture, we see the Israelites chasing foreign gods and pleasures of the world instead of pursuing God and their calling. And so through that, God would send a Messiah to restore Israel. But however, he sent that Messiah, but the Israelites constantly rejected Jesus. And through all the preaching that Paul preached to the Jews, their response was typically rejection. <clears throat> and so God tells Paul, okay, if the Jews aren't going to listen, take your teaching to the Gentiles. And Acts twenty two twenty one says, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are now his ministry. And I'm going to be in Romans 11 today, but some backstory. 1 through 10 of Romans 11, we see a picture of what God has done with Israel. Romans 11, 1, Has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. And so we see that God has not completely rejected his people, but also not all of God's chosen nation is going to be saved and was not saved. Many of the Israelites failed to obtain righteousness because they put their faith in works of the law. However, Jesus came to fulfill the law so that they could put their faith in him through grace because the law, as we know through Romans 1-10 through 10 so far, the law is not sustaining. 
So through their rejection, God chose a few of them for salvation, and the rest had their hearts hardened. But why would God harden some of their hearts? So today our main text is Romans 11, 11 through 24. Um, if you have a digital Bible, I'll be reading out of the ESV. And if you have a bulletin, the main text will be on the back. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for um, bringing us here to church today. Thank you for um, your word and the, the series that we've gone through, Romans 1 through 10 and today 11. And I just thank you for the amazing opportunity to get up here and be used by you as a vessel to just preach your word. And I just pray that someone can get something out of this. Speak to hearts. Speak to my heart because this is not just for the congregation, but this is for me as well, Lord. And we give you all of the glory, regardless. And we thank you so much for everything you do, everything you're going to do. Thank you for giving us the option of salvation. You are worthy. And we pray for this in your name. Amen. All right, so like I said, Romans 11, 11 through 24. It says, So I ask, did they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, I'm speaking to you Gentiles. And as much then as I, as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous. And thus save some of them. For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. But if some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen, but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you are cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree... How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? And so right off the bat, we have this picture of a tree. And this tree represents the body and the unity of Christ. This tree is rooted in Christ, and its branches is the members, which is what we are. And so throughout this message, when I speak about the branches, that's going to be us. And when I speak of the root, that is God. And so today, based on the text, I want to give three truths from the tree. I was really proud of that alliteration. <laughs> three truths from the tree. So in the first few verses, we immediately answer the question of why Jesus would allow his chosen people, the Israelites, to stumble or to be cut off from the tree. Did God do it so they might completely fall? Absolutely not. God let his people, the Israelites, stumble so that the Gentiles could be included in the tree as well. It says in the verses, the Israelites were the natural branches of the tree, but they were cut off in their disbelief. And this allowed the Gentiles to be grafted into the tree. God used their disobedience to bring a larger group of people into the faith. 
And Paul then brings up an amazing truth for the Jews as well. The Jews' disobedience led to the inclusion of the Gentiles, which his hope would then provoke the Israelites to jealousy, and not a negative jealousy. This is jealousy of what the Gentiles have, and that's salvation through Christ. And that would drive them to pursue Christ so that they may be made holy as well. And we know holiness comes from God and God alone. In the tree, the branches only become holy when they are connected to the tree. And so our first truth today, truth number one, the branch is made holy by the root. The branch is made holy by the root. And we see that in Romans eleven sixteen, If the dough offered as first fruits is holy, so is the whole lump. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. They're made holy by the root. And holiness, holiness is not obtained by works or being a good person. When our foundation is rooted in Christ, then and then alone are we made holy. But what even is holiness? And why can we only obtain it from God? Well, I have a quote from John Piper because I think he has an amazing definition. God's holiness is his infinite value as the absolutely unique, morally perfect, permanent person that he is and who by grace made himself accessible. His infinite value as the absolutely unique, morally perfect, permanent person that he is. God is rare, God is permanent, and he is, accepts, he is accessible. And to get to this tree, to obtain this holiness, all we need is belief and confession. Belief in your heart that Jesus is Lord and believe that he died for you, and confess that. But you might think, me? How can I be made perfect in the eyes of God? How can I be made holy? I've done too much. There is no way that I can be made perfect. Well, let's look at the writer of the book of Romans. Paul was a Jewish leader who murdered Christians before he was converted. Or someone you might know even better, King David, he was the king and he slept with a married woman and then had her husband killed. Or maybe Peter the disciple, who rejected Jesus three times. All of these people loved God but all had their flaws, and they did horrible things. But God forgave them and made them holy anyways. When we are made holy, God sets us apart like he is set apart. And through that, we have a direct connection with God that is made to clean us from the inside out. Psalm 56 has David asking for a clean heart. So we are set apart, being made perfect in the eyes of God so that we can be drawn to him and have relation with him. And so let me ask you today, do you truly believe that God can make you holy? Do you believe that you can be connected to the body of Christ? Do you believe that your sin is so tremendous that God can't make you holy? and that you cannot be grafted into the immovable, unshakable tree of God. If not, after the sermon, come to me or come to Jason or one of the elders, and we will share with you how you can have that certainty. Because through Christ, we have changed positions before God. We were once his enemy, and now we are considered his child, and we are holy. But to go further, just because our position with God changes, it doesn't mean our struggles are going to stop. Let's look at our passage again. Romans eleven seventeen 17 through 20. 
If some of the branches were broken off, and you, although a wild olive shoot, were grafted in among the others, and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. If you are, remember it is not you who support the root, but the root that supports you. Then you will say, branches were broken off, so that I might be grafted in. That is true. They were broken off because of their unbelief, but you stand fast through faith. So do not become proud, but fear. So our second truth today, truth number two. The branch is supported by the root. The branch is supported by the root. It is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. And so Paul immediately hits us with a much needed truth bomb in this verse, especially in today's day in America. God does not need you. Let me say that again. God does not need you. However, God is gracious to even allow us to be grafted into the tree. He is gracious. But you don't know it right now, but in the previous verses, Paul calls us worthless without God. He calls us a wild olive shoot. And if you know anything about olive trees, they bore no fruit because they weren't cultivated or taken care of. So they were just big worthless weeds. They had no value. And going even further, this picture is more beautiful when you realize that the beautiful, natural olive tree, rich with sap and nutrients, had its natural branches cut off so that the branches of the worthless olive tree could be grafted in to partake in its richness. Hebrews 10.9 Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. These verses should negate any arrogance we might have of being better or more holy than someone. And also, it should uplift those who feel like they are not as holy as other people. Holiness comes from the Lord. So someone who might have the skills to teach and speak, or someone who might have a ministry job, is not better or more holy than someone who struggles to talk in front of people or has a career outside the church. Nobody on staff at East River Park is more holy than its congregation. There is zero room to boast on either side. The Jewish people, they have no room to boast because in their unbelief they were cut off. But the Gentiles, they also have no room to boast because it is a gracious thing for God to even consider adding them in. All people are sinful. And Romans 11.20 is a straight warning for the Gentiles and us not to be arrogant toward the Jews because of their inclusion. And they're cutting off. And so the same is for us today. Growing up for me, I struggled with being both arrogant and also feeling less than others. I'm a baby-faced, chunky guy who is a goofball. That's usually how I describe myself. So in my life, though, I have always, because of this, been looked down upon and not taken seriously by others. I never felt like I could be like some of the people who are in ministry or even be like some of my friends who I did life with every single day because they might have known more about Scripture. I went to a Bible study in my late teens and early 20s with a bunch of guys who were my age and I would never talk because I felt like I wasn't smart enough or wise enough to have anything important to say. They would always ask me, man, you're super quiet. It's like, well, I feel dumb. But don't feel pity on me yet because I grew up in the church since probably the day I was born. 
but I, just because I was in the church since I was born, doesn't mean I'm a good person. I've been guilty of looking down on people. There have been times when God's glory was not my motivation. At my old church and the church before, I would see people go to the altar all the time. And my first thought almost every single time would be that they are not genuine in what they were doing. And sometimes that was true. But why was my first thought negative? Instead of rejoicing for that person because they were taking the right steps or they were receiving salvation. I was arrogant towards them, but I was just as broken as every single person that I looked down upon. 1 Corinthians 12, 5 and 6. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. The same God at work. We are all supported by the root, and regardless of what or how many gifts the Lord has given us, they should be used for the glory of God, not for selfish gain or ambition. Paul even says not to be haughty, but fear. And in other translations, it'll say, but be afraid or tremble. But what is there to be afraid of? We have been grafted into the tree. Why would Paul tell us to fear if we have been grafted into the tree? What is there to fear? Well, let's continue. Romans 11, 21 through 24. For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the kindness and the severity of God. Severity towards those who have fallen but God's kindness to you, provided you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off. And even they, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, How much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? So our final truth today, truth number three. Without steadfast faith, the branch will be cut off from the root. Without steadfast faith, the branch will be cut off from the root. This is not something to take lightly. We have a truth that is detrimental to our salvation. Faith that doesn't last is not faith at all. Faith that doesn't last is not faith at all. And we see two viewpoints here all the time for these verses that people tend to hold to. So the first one, it's the Arminian viewpoint that is called conditional salvation. This is the belief that Christians can lose their salvation if they actively reject the Holy Spirit's influence on their life. And then we have the Calvinistic viewpoint referred to as perseverance of the saints. This is the belief that once God has drawn the elect into faith, then they have it. If you have genuine faith and are in a state of saving grace, then you will never lose it. If you lost it, then you never had it. Personally, for myself, I tend to lean towards the perseverance of the saints uh, because of 1 John 2.19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they all are not of us. And then also Philippians 1.6. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. He will bring it to completion. God cut off the Israelites from the tree because of their unbelief. They never had genuine faith, so they were cut off. 
And then Paul states that if he did not spare the unbelieving Jews, then he wouldn't spare you. Any person who proclaims the name of Jesus and then loses their faith never had it to begin with. The biggest example in the Bible that I could find is Judas Iscariot. The Bible tells us that Jesus called the 12 disciples together. He gave them power and authority over demons, and they also received the power to heal. And this includes Judas. Judas was involved in ministry. He had power from the Lord, but that didn't save him. We think of Judas as this man who chose the wrong path, but this man also saw God through many miracles. Judas saw the raising of Lazarus from the dead. He saw the calming of the storm. And also, he was there for the feeding of the 5,000. He saw miracles. He saw Jesus. He was there. Yet he still chose to betray Jesus. It was a downward spiral. But his heart was never changed by God. And the Bible says he had unconfessed sin in his life and it opened the door for Satan to enter. Judas had seen the things of the Spirit. He had seen the power that came from the Spirit. Yet he wasn't forgiven of his sins because he never confessed, he never had a change of heart, and he was never indwelled by the Holy Spirit. So ultimately, he was cut off from the tree. And regardless of where you land theologically, whether you believe you can lose your salvation or not, you cannot live your life as a believer and do the exact same things you were doing before. 2 Corinthians 5.17 If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things have passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So does this mean that once we have salvation, we can't sin anymore? We all know that that is not true. Absolutely not. We are a new creation with a new heart and mind devoted to Christ, but we still have flesh. We're still going to sin, but we repent of it. And we are convicted through the Holy Spirit. And this also is not just a one-time thing. Notice in my point, I didn't just say faith. I said steadfast faith. Because you might have a small amount of faith in God, but if it doesn't last until the end, it wasn't faith at all. And so when we say a life devoted to Christ... That's just what it means, a full life. A life of constant trust and faith in God, regardless of what happens. Because we see most of the disciples were martyred for Christ. But all of this comes together, though, through hope. We can have assurance in our faith, because when we truly accept Christ and have genuine faith, then we're saved, and there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. Nothing can separate. Romans 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So can you be cut off from the tree? Yes. You absolutely can be cut off from the tree. God did not spare the unbelief of the Jews, and he will not spare you if you live your life and die in unbelief. So when Paul tells us not to be arrogant, but fear, he means that we should have a respect and fear of God. 
Because while he gave us a spot on the tree, it's available, he can just as easily cut us off. So I'm going to give you my, my summary point for the day. God is patient, but not forever. God is patient, but not forever. When I was in high school, <clears throat> I knew that I had not accepted Christ as my Savior. I would go to school and every single day, the conviction of knowing I had no faith was almost too much to bear. And it took me about a month of this constant conviction to step out in faith. God was drawing me to the saving power of Jesus. God was patient with me, and he didn't give up. <clears throat> God was patient with the Jews, with the Israelites. They had plenty of chances to turn to God and away from their unbelief. But some of them didn't. God was patient with the Gentiles. They had plenty of chances to turn to God. But some of them didn't. But today, God is patient with you. He is patiently waiting for you to turn away from your sin, to turn to Jesus, confess that He is Lord, and believe that He died for you. He is still patiently waiting, but tomorrow is never promised. 2 Corinthians 6.2 Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. <clears throat> if you have never accepted God as your Savior, today is the day to do it. Jesus is interceding for you right now. Step out in faith. And I personally or another leader will meet you and talk about the decision to follow Christ, to know what it means. And if you have already been grafted into the tree and are following God with steadfast faith, but you need to pray with someone or you just have some questions, please don't hesitate to ask. So I'm going to pray and we'll worship. But if you want to dive deeper, Behind the Message releases on Thursdays. And if you have any questions or prayers, uh, me and some leaders will be at the front. Let's pray.